Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. Welcome to this video. This video is on the functional derivative and it looks at the ideas of the uh, functional and the functional derivative. Now it's going to use an example to explain both concepts and then shows how they apply when interpreting the result of the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action when deriving the gravitational field equations in vacuo. So let's go, let's make a start on that, just move that here. Now, this derivation here is covered in a, a series on the variational approach to general relativity, um, and I've just taken it straight from there, so ha have a look at that. What I just want to do, though, is to get at the idea in this video of a functional and of this object here, which is the functional derivative. So we can derive the Einstein field equation of vacuo by setting the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the metric to zero, um, so that we end up with, in that video with this, uh, from which we found that this object is equal to this, which is equal to zero, because it's the extremal case. The variation of the action is set to zero. Um, and then this is this object here, a functional derivative, has this sort of form using the deltas. Okay, so first let's have a look at what a function is briefly, and then we'll go to the functional derivative. So a functional derivative is a concept that arises in the context of functional analysis and variational calculus. It is a generalization of the derivative concept to functionals. So it's similar to the ordinary derivative. It's generalizing that now to functionals, which are mappings from a space of functions to the real numbers. So a functional is just a mapping from a space of functions to the real numbers, just like a function is a mapping from real numbers to real numbers. Um, uh, this one is a mapping from the space of functions to real numbers. Okay, uh, so what is a functional? A functional is a mapping that takes a function as its input and returns a real number. For example, consider a functional j of y that depends on a function y of x. So j of y is defined thus, all right, where this uh, f is some function of x, y of x, y dash of x. So f is some given function of x, y of x, and the derivative of y dash of x. And the functional is then the integral a to b of this, right? which will return a number, as you can imagine, for integrating over these terminals here with respect to x. This is a function of functions of x. OK, um, let's just move that a bit out of the way here. Now, the functional derivative. So the functional derivative j of y with respect to y of x is a measure of how j changes when the function y of x is varied. It is denoted by delta j on delta y of x and is defined in such a way that it captures the first order variation of the functional. All right. Here. Now, the functional derivative, delta j on delta y of x, is defined by the following limit, just as you might expect with ordinary derivative. Delta j on delta y of x is the limit epsilon approaches zero of this object here. And epsilon is a small number, obviously, just as in ordinary derivatives. But eta here, where eta of x is an arbitrary test function that is used to probe the variation of y of x. So it's a totally arbitrary function of x, okay, um, just to probe the variation uh, of y of x. All right, so j of y represents some, so intuitively speaking, so if you want an intuitive sense of what this is about, if j of y represents some physical quantity, all right, like in general relativity, the action s, Okay, it represents something about the physical system that depends on the function of y of x, then delta j on delta y of x tells us how sensitive j is to small changes in y of x. So let's just give an example here. Let's consider a simple function, j of y, integral a to b, y of x squared dx. All right, there's our simple functional, a function of functions. All right, let's... Let's see how j of y changes with respect to small changes in y of x. Here we go. So to find the functional derivative of j with respect to y of x, we compute 
okay, this object here. So we're going to need that j of y plus epsilon times eta minus j of y. Put that over epsilon and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So first we compute j y of epsilon eta times eta. Okay, so that's, um, remember, uh, j of y was just y of x all squared, but we're going to put in there this y plus epsilon times eta of x, and then square it all. So expanding the integrand, expanding that out, we get all this. All right, and then I might just hide that. Then what we're going to do is, that then tells the j y of epsilon times eta is this object. Just simply substituting that in here. Okay, now next thing, so we've got this first bit here. Now we need this second bit, which is what we started the question with. So we're going to have that minus that. It's simply this minus this integral here. Okay, next step. All right, next thing we're going to have, just remind you again what we have. Remember the y of x bit squared is cancelled out now because we subtracted it. So we just reduced down to this. Notice we have an epsilon here and an epsilon squared here. So our next two steps will be to then divide by epsilon, divide both sides here by epsilon, okay, and um, then take the limit as epsilon approaches zero. So let's just divide by epsilon first. So we do that, epsilon. Dividing through by epsilon, we take that one out and one factor of epsilon from here. All right, now taking the limit as epsilon approaches zero, we notice that this term epsilon times eta of x all squared vanishes. That will vanish as epsilon goes to zero. And so we're left with the functional derivative as being this object here. And what we'll actually find, so we have as our first result, this, we'll actually be able to go further uh, and you'll see that shortly. All right, before we do that, just notice also, just coming from a slightly different direction, that the variation of J is delta J is this minus this. Okay, which is this object here we've already found, which for small epsilon, we can ignore the epsilon squared term because if epsilon is very small, um, then epsilon squared will be very much smaller again. All right, we're talking about terms well less than epsilon well less than one. So delta J becomes approximately this object here. Now, but the definition of the variation of J is delta J is this. It involves the functional derivatives times this eta of x dx. Okay, so from this result and the one on the previous slide, we see that the functional derivative here must be this bit, this 2y of x. Okay, just remember, notice the variation of j is this, which leads us here and here. And then we can equate this bit must be this bit because we found um, this bit earlier on, okay, on the previous slide. All right, let's go on there. All right, so the variation delta j of the functional j is a small change in j resulting from a small change in the function y of x. If we vary the function y of x by a small amount, eta of x, then the variation of j is denoted by delta j. Let me put that there. All right, now the functional derivative of delta j on delta y of x tells us how the functional j of y changes in response to small variations in the function y of x. Now it generalizes, that's the functional derivative, the concept of derivative to functionals, playing a crucial role in variational calculus and fields like physics, where action functions are used to derive equations of motion through the principle of least action. Which brings us now back uh, from earlier, from the derivation of the Einstein field equations in vacuo, by vary, varying the, the action for the gravitational part, we've got this bit. The matter part is separate. There's another action for that, um, which you can see the videos that I've done on that, or the video I've done on that. Okay, and so that this object here, we can now see by the definitions is equal to this. And that tells us straight away that the, um, the functional derivative of this part here is equated with this bit here. All right, so let's have a look. We'll just go over. Here we are. And so we have one on the square root minus g, we started with earlier on, is this in vacuo, which set was all, as we discovered, equal to zero. So the action s is a function of the metric here and the inverse metric, all right? And um, by varying that inverse metric by a little bit, we're not, uh, because this is equal to zero, there's, it's 
the uh, the action is not sensitive. S is not sensitive to small changes in here. It's quite around here. You're going to get around uh, for small variations in the metric. You're going to result in these will be your field equations, all right? It's not very sensitive because it's equal to zero. So delta S on delta G mu nu tells us how sensitive S is to small changes in G mu nu in the inverse metric or metric because uh, the inverse is related to the uh, metric. All right, that's it. I hope that's helpful. Um, thank you everyone for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next video.